welcome back to Data Leads. In today's episode, we're doing a new diary of a solution architect in the series. We'll cover things like job hunting tips, career progression tips, as well as the life before, during, and after being a solution architect. Today, I have my teammate, Daniel, on the episode. And he's going to talk to you about life as a senior solution engineer in Databricks from a new joiner perspective. Welcome, Daniel. Hey, right. Ping, how's it going? You all right? I'm good. I'm very good. Come from playing Friday afternoon. Uh, so, Daniel, do you want to introduce yourself? So, yeah, I'm Daniel. I'm a senior solutions engineer here at Databricks. And as of now, I've been here about 12 weeks. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your role before joining Databricks? Yeah, so before joining Databricks, I was a customer of Databricks at a healthcare and life sciences company. They specialized in clinical waste. So they have a very um, clever set of bins and disposal apparatus that they send into theater settings, hospitals, dentists, doctors. So they... They have a heavy amount of regulation and they generate a lot of data, be it from the processing of the waste, the manufacture of the bin, the vehicle travel, all of your normal like revenue and ERP stuff, marketing, bits of IoT, uh, lots of images of bits of horrible stuff in bins. Uh, so Databricks was a real, a real like accelerant for them, really. Um, yeah. I was right in the mix of that with being there, sort of like lead data engineer or data engineer, whatever you'd like to call it. So what motivated you to your time to Databricks? Simply, I, I like the product and I like the people. It seemed like a good idea. If you're doing data engineering all the time and just in your context and you really, really like it, it's a lot of fun and you do get things done, but you end up a little bit blinkered. You, are, I, I'm really good with all the data engineering around bins. But if you want to see stuff beyond that or you know, sort of get in the mix about all these mad things people build with the platform, you probably need to be at Databricks to see that sort of stuff. See, see that stuff. Did you do any preparation before you interviewed? Yeah, yeah, a lot. So there was, so obviously I had, you know, the certifications. I'd done the data engineering one um, just because it was like a desired criteria. Mm -hmm. And then I spent a lot of time sort of reading up on, you know, Spark things, Delta things, and to sort of remove the blinkers that I might have. You know, I was really used to using UC, DB SQL, things like that, but I'd really not done a lot of, um, let's say, auto ML on the platform. So that, although I thought I'd got like, two and a bit years of hands-on experience. It you could have equally equally many months of experience, but not have touched the same tools within Databricks. Okay. So it, there was a lot of that sort of prep that I had to do. So how did you find the interview process? Were we hard on you? It it was the hardest and most stressful interview process I've ever done. Oh wow. But, Hands down, it was really hard. That's not to say that it wasn't. It, it was. They were very helpful. Like at each stage of the interview, it was very clear what I had to deliver, who was going to be assessing me, what I was being assessed on, what the deliverables were. And I remember they they also send you like a survey thing because they I think they sort of appreciate that it takes a bit of a toll on you doing all these stages. So you know, if I was struggling with anything like health wise or you know whatever they were very supportive in that sense but nonetheless the interviews were really hard how's your onboarding for the first person pretty good pretty good i think i've got some advantages having a lot of product experience so some of that i could get along with very quickly uh, i haven't much of a pre-sales background um so there was a there was a big like balancing period of having to do lots of training videos, lots of courses, lots of bits and pieces to sort of level me out. But the the, the support I got from my team was pretty good. 
you know, obviously I, I work in a larger team. There are other smaller teams, and I imagine they have very different experiences relative to their markets and you know whatever they're doing. But so overall, onboarding is pretty good. I, you know, just this week I finished flight school, um, like culminating my first ten or twelve weeks, whatever it's been. Um, it feels good to be on the other side of that. You know, just be getting towards being useful. I think onboarding is a is a it's a good experience. Man, like to your points, it's a balance act, right? Like some people are more technical than themselves, some people are more themselves than technical. So what would you say is the biggest difference between now you're working for Databricks versus you shared with as a customer? So I had a very sort of hands-on keyboard role as a customer. So that was the bulk of my time, you know, it just in the in the platform doing stuff all the time, you know, scattered with a few meetings and they were very, you know, well-defined boundaries you know deliver this pipeline build this model do this thing um my role is no longer that you know really at all um there is a there is a good amount of like hands-on keyboard stuff but it is more research but delivering key ideas demonstrating ideas helping customers with use cases you i guess it's still as useful it's like, oh, I'm helping somebody else do it now rather than me doing the doing and then handing it over. But it is it is really different being less and less hands-on keyboard. It's hard to it's hard to let go of that sort of stuff. Like you feel like it, you, you feel like you were an expert in your little, you know, your small goldfish bowl that you were working in. And now you're in a really big bowl and you're like, oh no, what am I supposed to do here? Um, but I, like you say, pick your own adventure. One part of the sort of onboarding process that highlighted how different things were is that there is like there are many, many, many different sorts of essay. Yeah. You know, people have got really different experiences, and they've like you said, they've carved out their own path, they've done their own thing. And I guess in the first few weeks, you feel weird. You're like, ah, a lot of these essays are very different to me. Am I am I normal? But then you realize that there will come a time where your exact skill set and background is like the thing that everyone needs. And you're like, ah, oh, yes, I'm in. I'm, it's all right now. Exactly. You know? So the surprising thing about the product, I'd say, from the outside, it looks like, it looks really good. It looks, everything is great. And you saw these features just come out and they sort of appear. And then all of a sudden there's a nice shiny button on the inside, the absolute monumentous amount of work that goes into those sorts of things and the collaboration and stuff. I, I didn't realize that all of the people, the expertise, the innovation that goes into just making another button for me as a, as a consumer, I'm like, oh, great. Now there's a marketplace. This is great. So that really surprised me. I didn't, I didn't really understand what it took to do that sort of stuff. As for the organization, it's it's surprising how open it is you know there's this giant sort of hive mind of people that are there to help you do stuff innovate whatever and i think if you've come from an perhaps you've experienced a more traditional corporate environment where there's a very stiff hierarchy there's very um plodding processes should we say you it's quite scary to be like what everything's on the table. If you think you, if you've got genuinely an argument to improve something, you can you know rally some like-minded people around you and solve a problem. It, it's up for change. It's up for being solved. That was a big surprise. It, it's a bit scary as well because you're like, okay, I'm now gonna. I, I see this problem. I think I can solve it. And you're sort of putting your whole solution out there to the entire company. Um, and that, that that's a bit weird, but it's good. What was your biggest? Right. That's a really good question. Why my, my biggest learning since I joined it, it's probably something like you're not flying solo. Mm -hmm. You know, from from a as a customer, or like, you know, if I'm zoomed in as a data engineer on this problem, I'm trying really hard to get it solved. You might have a few teammates to talk to, you might have your, you know, your principal engineer, your lead, whatever. 
Um, or you've got to pick up the phone to Databricks and find your essays and your AEs, right? F- from the inside, I am super not alone. There's like this giant swathe of information and, and stuff to do. And I was like, okay, that is a that is a different way for me to approach my tasks. That is really, really different. You know, there's there's a set of subject matter experts for almost anything you can imagine. So I don't have to research in that way. Um yeah, yeah, I'd say just the way that I approach a, a normal task has probably changed in the last 12 weeks. The biggest challenge. Mm-hmm. I think, yeah, I found it challenging to move away from being a like that customer mindset, that sort of individual techie hands-on mindset. That was really challenging. Um, and you get, you get quite a lot of responsibility pretty quick if you want it. Uh, and that can be daunting. Uh, many, 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 many people told me to protect my time. You know, be very careful about what you take on because there's some, there's so much to do, and it, it's challenging to to like sort of contain your own excitement. There's like fifty projects that you can get stuck into, be it you know something Gen AI based, something more traditional, something internal. Some you know, there's a lot of stuff to go after, mm-hmm. and it's all moving very, very, very quickly. So it it is challenging keeping a lid on your own ambitions. So what would be your favorite part? My favorite part? Yeah. It, I really like the team I work in. It's, it's nice. They're really good people. You know, if I need something, they're there to help me. Um, I do like the product as well. It is fun doing the product. It is, it is fun demonstrating these cool new capabilities. That, that is all nice. But it's really, really good to just like look around you and your immediate and broader team and be like, all right, we can do this. We've got this covered. But looking back from who decided I'm going to find a change difference to the Did you do everything differently? So I guess it's worth mentioning that because I'm remote, all of my interviews were remote as well. So yeah, it was really, so every stage that I went into, I'd got a really detailed set of notes. I knew what I was shooting for. I'd got, I knew who I was interviewing with, what the task was. I'd got all my notes on all these bizarre things. I've got strong examples of stuff that I've done before. And I didn't have to do like the dreaded activity where they just give you a pen and you've got to start drawing. It, it, it was a pre-prepared a bit. So in terms of prep, I think I had it quite easy and I probably mm-hmm. wouldn't change much. You know, do the research, do make good notes, do bring everything you need with you, do read again and again and again the documents that they send you because of the information that you're being assessed on is in there. I wouldn't. I really wouldn't change much. Uh, I would have probably. I was a bit eager, and I condensed down the stages to quite a short time frame, and that was probably a mistake. That was probably a risk. Um, if you could stretch them out a bit, so you've got a little bit more time to like recover, retrain. Because obviously, you've got to do it along, alongside your day job, right? You know, you've got to you've got to find the time to prepare and learn and do all this stuff. So take your time and try and find it. Don't don't cram it because you'll perform worse. I always get stressed. Uh, would I do anything about my onboarding differently? Probably not. Probably not. Everything's pretty well organized, pretty good. Uh, good to shadow people early on. So you, you'll just feel more normal. You know, you'll just feel like, oh, okay, yeah, I, I do know the answer to that. And it's also okay to not be an absolute PhD level genius in every part of the platform. There are people to help. And just experiencing that with the customer is really good early on. Maybe getting shadowing opportunities or meeting people that aren't in your department. Like if you're in a very, you know, large strategic set of things, go and do some time and some sessions with people that do a really different set of things to you because it it is very different. You know, I was lucky that I sort of had a couple of friends and I knew a couple of people here and there. So I sort of understood it was different. But if I was a new joiner and I'd just come in, I was just shadowing my own team or like my adjacents. Go go find something super different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My advice would be you, you can get a you can get a free trial of the product. You can like set stuff up. A lot of it is open source if you want to like hand roll it yourself. Like get time with the product because it is evolving quickly. And there'll be bits that you like and there'll be bits that you don't like. And I think having a a firm but you know well well-read opinion on the platform is good 
you know, if if all you've read is the marketing material, mm-hmm. that is not a good idea. Do do know the underlying technologies, do have a tinker with them, do use the product, do, you know, you know, just have a go at it yourself, right? And then I would say don't be don't be afraid to ask questions in the interview. Like I I got asked a really particular question and I just had no idea what they were on about. And I said, I, I need a hand. Can you just run me through it a little bit more slowly they're not they're not vicious or anything like that but they do really know what they're on about so ask if you don't understand and if you really really don't understand don't guess because they know okay don't guess just admit that you don't know off to follow up handle it professionally and just roll on you know it's not (laughs) if you don't know some mental thing about optimization it's cool not everybody does just handle it professionally if you're a new joiner you're currently onboarding ask an irritating amount of questions of your colleagues just really push your luck ask all the questions find all the things search around in the internal tools that we've got um some of the videos you can play at double speed and some of them you're gonna have to play at half speed because some of it's really complicated and some of it's not um and they have a very open culture so i'd I'd say to you if you're onboarding reciprocate be open it's not good news if you keep something that you're uncomfortable with under under wraps for like two three four months and then it pops up in front of a customer if you don't know how to do something with auto ml just ask some someone will be absolutely over the moon that you've engaged them on their special topic and just go and ask them you know yeah I would strongly advise you to avoid the latest and greatest stuff because it is an iterative journey. Getting good with your like basic Spark data frames, having a go at structured streaming, doing normal things with normal delta tables, you know, just go steady. And if you prefer, like, you remember it's like multi language, right? If you're really good at SQL, don't force yourself to learn loads and loads of Python. Don't bend over backwards to be like, oh, I don't know how to do any Scala. But, you know, it's built that way for a reason. It's fine. Uh, And then as you get further into it, then go for the more jazzy features, the, the really cool stuff, because more likely than not, you might... you. Let's say you get really involved in some of like the mosaic AI stuff. That's going to be great, but how realistic is it that you're going to be using it when you've just started learning Databricks? More often than not, you're going to be picking files up from cloud storage, crunching them through some medallion architecture, and then serving them out somewhere. Just really get a grip of the basics, and then the jazzy stuff comes a lot more naturally. Don't don't go berserk. No, I really appreciate you having me on leaving. It was great. Thank you. Thank you for watching Data Leaps. If you think the content is useful, please like and subscribe to the channel. I would really appreciate it.